And our next speaker is okay. Cayetano. And Cayetano is a colleague and a friend of mine for very long now, Tano. And he's an IKEA research professor at IRB in Barcelona, Spain. And he studies the molecular and cell biological mechanisms driving cell proliferation and malignant growth. More specifically, he's been interested in analyzing the role of cancer genline uh, genes in somatic malignant growth, but also the molecular basis of sex-linked differences in cancer. And I think that lately they have also focused on drosophila models of pediatric cancer. So Tano, thank you very much for joining us and all yours. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see if I can share my screen properly, yeah? Yes. Right, okay, so a pleasure to be here. Um, I, as, uh, I wanted to use this uh, time I had to summarize some of the take home messages that we have learned over the years uh, working on some uh, models of uh, tumor skin flags. There are hundreds of tumor suppressors in the Drosophila genome, and most of them behave like this example over here, to produce a hyperplasia in this case of the neural epithelium, which is obviously enlarged, very significantly enlarged with respect to the wild type. But among those hundreds that are, well, we still don't know, maybe 10, 20, no more identified so far that behave as malignant neoplasm suppressors. So these are genes that upon loss of function in situ result in gigantic malignant neoplastic overgrowth, right? Which upon allograft assays can be demonstrated to be immortal. Uh, so that uh, it makes the point that these cells by losing these tumor suppressors have uh, acquired limitless replication, replicative uh, potential. This is a wild type uh, brain uh, here on the left, the uh, half side of it. Upon implantation in a healthy host, it does not grow. The tissue that we call uh, malignant neoplasm, the assay to classify it as malignant neoplasm is this allograft assay through which uh, if we implant a tiny bit of this brain into the abdomen, it will grow, will take over the entire abdomen of the host in less than two weeks uh, usually and kill the host. So these are the models of malignant and neoplastic growth uh, we work with in flies. And we have used this uh, to study different aspects of malignant growth. The first one is one we stumble upon is a nucleid, the role of a nucleid and chromosome instability in malignant growth. A nucleid chromosome instability is a common trait in human cancer, in human carcinomes. So we were delighted to see that Unlike the wild type karyotype, which is presented by all the cells in the wild type brain, these brain tumors often contain cells affected by a nucleid, in some cases a full tetraploid, like in here, subtetraploides, and so forth. So that means that the abnormal growth of these malignant neoplastic tumors and a nucleid are uh, coexisting. We have wild type brains that contain diploid cells with a normal karyotype. And we also have cells which are obviously um, abnormal in terms of chromosome content in the tumorous brains. But the question is, which is the cause and which is the consequence? And this is a of debate in human oncology for decades, still is, uh, and we don't know anything about human cancer, but we can definitely address and settle the issue in the sophila. And for that, what we did was to, in wild type brains, induce the presence of cells that are aneuploid like those found in tumors. We produce many of these through different types of uh, mutations, different types of aneuploid, the gain of a single chromosome, full tetraploid, octoploid, and so on and so forth. And generated, as I said, those cells to happen to appear within a normal brain during normal development. And the question was indeed whether when we force a nucleid in a wild type brain, it continues through normal development 
or generate tumors? A very simple answer to this question is that no, it does never cause tumors. This is based on literally hundreds of observations, testing dozens of conditions that cause aneuploidy, and in no case was the abnormal, the unexpected appearance of aneuploid cells within the brain a cause for the brain to develop as tumors. Much on the contrary, those brains tend to develop very abnormally. And if we introduce a tumor suppressor condition in this background, the tumor does not develop well. So if anything, having a tendency to generate aneuploidies in this setting, in this uh, in the drosophila larval, developing larval brain tumor is an anti-tumorogenic condition. So the first lesson from our studies past years is that aneuploidy chromosome instability in our model system, I insist, is a consequence, not the cause of malignant brain tumor development in drosophila. And when I say brain tumor, you can extend that to uh, discs, larval discs as well, where we did similar studies to reach uh, the same conclusion. Okay. A second area of interest, which again, like most of the, probably like all the, the ones I will mention today, is something we stumble upon just by, driven by the curiosity of finding out what uh, is going on in these uh, tumors, what is the biology behind them, is uh, sumaraisia. In this case, we're working with a brain tumor called malignant brain tumor, MBT, that was identified by a friend and colleague of mine, Elizabeth Gatev, many years ago. So we, some years ago, managed to produce the first transcriptomic profile of these tumors. Here you have the transcriptomics of a wild type brain, and here three MBT mutant brains, that means MBT tumors. So it was very obvious from these studies that MBT tumors produce a major dysregulation of the genome, which very notably, very conspicuously results in the upregulation of germline genes. So if those of you who are familiar with Drosophila or Genesis and Spermatogenesis, you will be shocked to recognize all these names over here, Aubergine, C3G, Malmström, Tudor. These are genes which are normally expressed in the germline. Most of them in the female germline, some of them in both of them, that means in the germline within testes and ovaries, and definitely not expected to be expressed in a brain. But these are tumor brains, they are dysregulating genes, and this is what we found. The first feeling, indeed, was that drosophila does very unusual things. But that was only uh, to prove our ignorance, because it turns out that in the human oncology field, the, the research in what they call cancer testis antigens is an, old, is an old field on its own right. Here you have some of the publications. There are hundreds of these. A major one published in 2005, a more recent one recently. There are many of these. So what are cancer testis genes in human oncologies? In human oncology, these are genes which are normally expressed only in the germline and become topically expressed in somatic tumors of many different types in humans, I insist, in human oncology. They are suspected to contribute to malignant traits like immortality, invasiveness, and all this, but that is still unproven for, in most cases, in human cancer. And these genes are referred to in the human literature as cancer testes, even though uh, some of them are actually also expressed in normal ovaries. So the term cancer testes or cancer transfer germline is are both of them are acceptable. So going back to our data, uh, we have found something which is actually not that unexpected. If you know well the human literature, the upregulation, the unscheduled upregulation of genes that are normally expressed only in the germline, uh, but now are unscheduled upregulated in a somatic uh, tumor, in this case in a brain tumor. Now the, that's interesting. It's even more interesting, perhaps, the fact that some of these genes, like Mastron, Tudor, C3G, and others, are actually the Drosophila ortholog of what were known in the human literature as cancer testes for years. Cancer testes have been historically given a number depending on 
um, the time of appearance um, in the literature. So one of the first to be identified was SYCP1 that happens to be the Drosophila, the human ortholog of Drosophila C3G, a gene that produces a protein which is required for the synaptic Autonomal complex. For years, way before we found, we made these observations, uh, this YCP1 was referred to in human oncology as cancer testis number 18. So what we have here now is a possibility to test what in the human oncology field has been not so easy to test, which is whether or not the regulation of these genes is a bystander product of malignancy or these genes are actually contributing to tumorogenesis. So I, I'm showing you here only uh, two examples of hundreds that we have tested. <clears throat> and here I'm choosing this gene, which is not actually a cancer test. This is just one of the genes which is most strongly upregulated in MBT tumors, not a cancer test itself. And this is a cancer test in our, in, in our case, in the case of MBT tumors. And I'm showing you PXT because when we mutagenize PXT in an MBT mutant background, absolutely nothing happens. The brain grows tumoral upon injection, it kills the fly, it behaves as a malignant neoplasm. And I have chosen this one because PXT is the gene which is most strongly upregulated uh, by affymetrix studies, by RNA sec studies. And there is a very interesting take home message here. This message, the very simple message that being strongly upregulated doesn't necessarily mean function. The other example I've chosen for obvious reasons is a bona fide germline gene, nanos. And in this case, we were able to show that upon loss of nanos, MBT brain tumors do not grow in situ. And when we test these brain tumors, which are mutant for MBT and therefore scheduled to develop a tumor like this one, if on top of lacking the MBT gene, they are also uh, and they are also mutant for nanos. The brain doesn't grow in situ and neither does it upon allograft assays. So in summary, uh, for years uh, in the human cancer field, somatic expression of germline genes has been recognized and the field refers to those as cancer testis genes. And for decades, uh, there has been to know, it has been known that there is a correlation, a very uh, clear correlation between uh, the expression of those genes and malignant growth, but whether one, which one was the cause and which one was the consequence was unknown. In the case of the model that we have identified of a brain tumor, somatic tumor, which are regulates germline genes, we have been able to put in the direction of the arrow right. And we now know that the expression of some of these germatic genes, some of these uh, gem, gem, sorry, some of these germline genes is absolutely required for the malignant growth of the somatic tumors. I gave you the case of nanos. We know of about 30 or 40 of the genes that behave uh, likewise. So to summarize uh, this observation, the Sophia brain tumors, some of them can upregulate cancer germline cancer test genes, whose orthologs are also known as cancer germline cancer test genes in human oncology. And we have been able to show that some of those are conserved, they have paralogs, and among those, a fraction are absolutely required for tumor growth. Now, taking advantage of these tumors, of these tumor models, we are able to do what is a standard technology in flies. And one of the most uh, powerful uh, tools, uh, applications one can do with these models is to carry out very high throughput screens. We have done so, I will not go through it in any detail, but uh, taking advantage of the model, we have been able to screen thousands of genes and identify suppressors like this one. So this is, again, the wild type condition, the tumor doesn't grow, no tumor grows upon allografted, allografting a small piece of a wild type brain that you can still see. Over here, this is the MBT case, mutant, a tumor suppressor that upon loss of function results in massive growth uh, within the abdomen. And in this case, what we have is a brain, which is MBT mutant as well, but it's also mutant for one of those suppressors. The tumor doesn't grow. Quite interestingly, we have, again, about a hundred of those. 
But among them, we have about half a dozen which behave in an amazing way because not only the loss of that tumor suppressor is impeding now the growth of the tumor upon allograft, but it's actually allowing for a rather normal larval brain tumor development. So it's not a simple cytostatic condition, but something which is actually counteracting the lack of the MBT tumor suppressor and neutralizing it in such a way that rather normal brain tumor development can take place. This is, again, in case it's not clear, a brain, larval brain, which is mutant for MBT, one would expect it to develop like this, but because of the lack of this particular suppressor, it's not growing. So we have some of those which indeed are in principle ideal uh, targets for therapy because they totally impede tumor growth but allow for rather normal, apparently completely normal development. There is a second very interesting observation for this kind of um, suppressors. All of them behave in this way. I told you before that MBT is characterized by having a transcriptomic signature, which is very distinct. This is the transcriptomic signature of the wild type brain and the corresponding transcriptomic signature of MBT. So all these about, I don't know, two, three hundred genes are strongly upregulated in MBT compared to the wild type. And now what we have here is a brain which is MBT and therefore one would expect it to have this signature, but it's a wild type looking MBT mutant because of the uh, presence of this second mutation. And so the wonder, the question is, what will the signature look like? And definitely against what I would have expected, the signature is that one. It's definitely not a bona fide and not a perfect MBT tumor signature, but it's much closer to the MBT signature than to the wild type. That actually in practical terms means that most of the genes which are abnormally upregulated in the MBT tumor background can remain upregulated without on their own being able to trigger tumor growth. And that there are only critical genes, those that have gone down the blue ones over here that must be really important for tumor growth. There is actually uh, as well, uh, a couple of interesting numbers that one can only derive from models like these ones in flies where one can uh, carry out high throughput screens and put high throughput screens together with uh, genome-wide uh, transcriptomic data. And again, without showing any of the data, I will just give you the interesting result. So we, um, I guess you are wondering how many of the upregulated genes turn out to be tumor suppressors in our screening. We have screened, as I said, over 4,000 genes until now, and absolutely all of the ones that were upregulated in MBT. And what we have found is that only six of what we define as the critical MBT tumor signature that contains about 120 genes, about 120 genes that are very highly upregulated in MBT tumors compared to wild type brains. Only six of them are absolutely required for tumor growth. If we introduce mutations for those genes, the tumor doesn't grow, which is interesting. But even more interesting is the fact that all the rest of them, nearly 100, of the genes, again, that out of the 18,000 probe sets that you can quantify in Affymetrix or out of the 20,000 genes that you can quantify by RNA-seq, uh, we're checking the 100 which are most upregulated and 95% of them are absolutely irrelevant for tumor growth. That's an interesting number. The other interesting number comes by comparing the results of um, high content genetic screens, checking for, looking for suppressors of MBT tumor growth, I mentioned this one, and suppressors of BRAD tumor growth, a different type of larval brain tumor, which I haven't mentioned at all until now. So this is another type of a strong tumor suppressor upon deletion. It behaves, um, grossly speaking, very much like 
MBT mutants, a uh, gigantic larval brain uh, grows, and this larval brain can be serially transplanted one hour after the other for years. So it's a malignant neoplasm that means the, meets the criteria of growing in a lower aft assays. So like I said, we have identified by screening uh, half of the genome, uh, 75 strong suppressors of rat tumor at 100 roughly suppressors of MBT tumor growth. Something that, as I said before, can hardly uh, be done in other model systems. And then the burning question here is, how common are they? And it turns out that very little. Again, I have to say against my expectations, most of the suppressors are tumor type specific. So let me recapitulate that by saying that a regulation of gene expression is absolutely not a good predictor of functional requirement. That most suppressors that uh, most of the suppressors that we can identify in drosophila screens are tumor type specific with some exceptions. And let me just make a point about this particular cancer testis gene, which is the one of which I show you the brain that looks like wild type, even though it's mutant for MBT, but it looks like wild type because it's also mutant for what I said before, what I called before, suppressor, I'm telling you now the name of the gene, May W68, SPOI11 in humans. SPOI11 is a well-known cancer test disease in humans. It was discovered as a cancer test disease in, in humans before we discovered May W61, 68 to do the same in flies. But, and it's been suspected indeed to play a role in uh, human cancer for decades. But our work in flies is the first one that has been able to show for obvious reasons, because uh, technology is simpler, because the experiments are much easier to do here. In the case of flies, we have been able to conclude, and this is the first instance in which a uh, SPO11 ortholog, May W68, is called in flies, is unequivocally shown to have a protumoral role without May W68 tumors, MBT tumors do not grow. And I will just mention it, even though I didn't go through any detail about point number seven, using this model, we have been able to show that this protumoral role occurs at the beginning, at the triggering point of the tumor. So in the case of the Rosophila MBT tumor, May W68 is absolutely required for the tumor to kick off, but totally dispensable for tumor maintenance. This is actually quite important because it makes the strong obvious point, obvious on the other hand, a very important point that finding targets without which the tumors don't grow is not good enough. We need to tell apart which targets are required for the very initial steps of tumor genesis, which does not necessarily mean being required later on for tumor maintenance. And uh, the last point I wanted to mention is uh, this fourth one, which again, we stumble upon serendipitously. We stumble upon serendipitously by looking at these panels of uh, tumors and, and get it really, really unpleasant. The very unpleasant feeling that we were lacking something here because of the strong heterogeneity of phenotypes. So, you know, this, this is an MBT tumor that looks like this. This is an MBT tumor that looks like that, that without knowing anything about the brain morphology. One can tell that they're very, very different, okay? So it took us actually a long time to realize that there were two fundamental landmarks here, which are this gray area, which is always located in this part, which would be proximal to the fly in the body. And this other landmark, which I highlighted here, which looks like a, like a war trench, right? And it's uh, this wavy structure over here. And notice that this brain that has a yellow line does not have that kind of a structure. And that this brain that has this structure has a very tiny yellow line. So by sorting these brains 
we were able to find that there are two populations here, very clearly, very distinct. And we were able to quantify that they got by a 50-50 ratio. A 50-50 ratio in genetics means only a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is sex bias and uh, sex linkage. And that was indeed the case. We were able to show that the guys on the left were females and the guys on the left were males. Uh, males are much more aggressive than females. Uh, they kill more hosts quicker than females. And males uh, happen to have a very particular proteome signature, meaning they upregulate genes, a few proteins, this is proteomics, they upregulate a few proteins much more than females. And these are proteins that are not uh, overexpressed in wild type brains. So this upregulation is uh, tumor dependent. One of those proteins is PHF7. And we were able to show that this being the typical MBT tumor brain I showed you before, if we delete PHF7, the male looking signature, which is a lot of wavy a yellow line over here, very small blue area over here, because inverse, this male brain now looks like a female. And very interestingly, these male brains upon loss of PHF7 become much less aggressive. They share, they show the malignant traits of a female, which has taken us to the very final conclusion that I wanted to mention today, which is Sumaricea. We are all familiar with tumor signatures. Uh, these are um, differences between tumors and normal tissue from the healthy tissue to the very high grade. There are genes which are obviously strongly upregulated comparing the high grade towards the healthy tissue. Well, we have identified now and found a very um, uh, interesting application for our sex link to more dimorphic signature, which are genes um, or proteins uh, uh, selected not by the different level of expression between the tumor and the healthy tissue, but the difference between male and female samples. And we have been able to show that some of these genes are absolutely critical for tumor growth. This is Sumaricea. Drosophila uh, brain tumors can recapitulate sex dependent malignancy, as found in some human cancer and proteins that belong to sex bias tumor signatures can be targeted to eliminate sex link enhanced malignancy. Now, I know we are uh, doing bad for time, and uh, so uh, I, I don't want to overdo it at all. Uh, Lola, uh, I think, uh, should I leave it here? I have a couple of more slides, let me know. Oh, well, you have like three questions. So it's really up to you if you want to answer those questions. Then... I will answer those questions. I know that uh, we should stick to time. And I was almost done. So let me just um, uh, summarize the people, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge the contributors to this, the people in my lab, and our collaborator um, on the pediatric cancer models, which I didn't mention today. Uh, with many thanks to them. So I will take questions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Tano. That was really nice talk, very insightful in, in the field of cancer. And the questions are, one of them is from Bagna, and she asks, does the ratio between what type and aneuploid cells in the larval brain have an influence in the formation of the tumor? The ratio between what type and mutant cells? No, the, the answer is no. Uh, there is something, what happens here is that as far as um, larval brain tumors are concerned, the malignant ones, the ones that behave as I just explained, uh, depend on, and regardless of the origin of the tumor, we can generate those tumors by altering the biology of the neuroepithelium or by altering the asymmetric cell division of neural stem cells, for instance. So through different oncogenic pathways, we generate tumors that macroscopically behave the same. And now all of them contain a fraction which ranges between 10 or, I don't know, 30% of cells that acquire, uh, that become unemployed. Um, malignancy does not correlate at all with that. If we increase the level of aneuploidy artificially, so we create conditions that generate the tumor, and also 
in a stabilized chromosome segregation through different mutant conditions, then the tumors become very happy and die. So increasing the level of aneuploidy in these tumors is actually an anti-tumor. Okay. okay. And another question is that the allograft from Hamed Matmos. The allograft model is pretty powerful. Thank you very much. Did you check for suppressors in the host rather than in the tumor? No, we have never done that. This is an open question that uh, I know different labs have been consulting with me about uh, doing that, uh, consulting only because they wanted to be, they needed to be trained for the for the injection. All, all, the, all, all I mentioned is published. I should say that if you go into my webpage, there is a link there to a series of videos where we teach how to do this allograft assay, which is actually really, really very easy. Okay, so we, we, I learned that from the old people in the field who very kindly showed me all these people are acknowledged as they should there. Yeah? So if any of you is interested in carrying out these allograft assays, uh, don't hesitate, go for it. Is Just check it in our webpage. We publish a paper with plenty of videos and it's very easy. The screening, uh, looking for suppressors of tumor growth, depending on the host uh, genome, uh, as far as I know, nobody has done it yet. We haven't done it. Okay, great. So thank you very much. So you can answer the, the, the third question if you wish, Tano, in the, in the Zoom, because we need to move on sure, sure. to our last speaker. Thank you again. Thank you. And it's going to be Ross Kagan who's going to introduce Eric. So Ross, let me, so Tano, you need to stop sharing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, try, I'm trying to... Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> trying to know how, because I cannot see, no. Uh, hold on a second. Um, this. 